Welcome to my channel. Let's look at the uterus. The uterus is the secondary female reproductive organ, and this organ creates the accommodation site for implantation. Using this image by the side, this is where we have the uterus. And if you look at the uterus at its lateral end, we have the emergence of the uterine tubes. We have two uterine tubes. We have one on this side and we have the other one on the other side. If you also go to the terminal end of the uterine tube, we then have the ovary. We also have two ovaries. We have one on this side and we have the other one on the other side. I've put up a lecture on the uterine tube and also the ovary. If you've not checked those lectures for, please kindly go and do so to keep yourself updated. But for the purpose of this class, we would be focusing on the uterus, and here we'll be highlighting the gross anatomy of the uterus, and also discussing some features that you should know as students of anatomy. The uterus is also referred to as the womb. It is the holotic world pear-shaped organ, and this pear shaped configuration is placed in an inverted position. If you look at this image up here, this is where we have the image of a pear. This is what a pear looks like. And if you look at the uterus here that is harrowed in this lower image here at this point, you see that it has the same configuration, but it is in an inverted pattern. So you have the uterus taking a pear shaped configuration, but in an inverted pattern. So if you try to relate this configuration with that of a pear here, you see that they have the same alignment. And if you go to the lateral end of the uterus, you have the emergence of the uterine tube. This is what is carried in purple. You have two of the uterine tubes. You have one on this side and you have the other one on the other side. And if you go further more onto the lateral region or edge of the uterine tube, we then have the ovary. This is the ovary here on this side, and this is the ovary here also on the other side. If you look at these three structures, the ovary, the uterine tube, and also the uterus, you see that they are located around the same space within the pelvic cavity. And this is because the functions that they exert are similar in respect to reproduction. A mature egg that is released in the ovary is released into the lumen of the uterine tube. This uterine tube then takes up this release egg and also move it or transport it to its own specific region, which is the ampulla where fertilization will occur. Upon fertilization in the ampulla region of the uterine tube, the fertilized egg will then need to be implanted in the wall of the uterus. So this fertilized egg is then taken back into the uterus where it is finally implanted. So you see that these three structures, the uterus, the uterine tube, and also the ovary, exact similar functions. And these functions are integrated together. And this is what we then finally leads to the birth of a baby. So using this lower image here, this is where we have the uterus at this point. You see that the uterus is sandwiched between the urinary bladder anteriorly. This is where we have the urinary bladder anteriorly here. And posteriorly, we have the rectum. And this is where we have the rectum at this posterior region. So within the female pelvis, you have the uterus sandwiched between the urinary bladder in the front and the rectum behind. These two structures are in a way creating structural support for the uterus. And this is how they are placed around this region. Let's drive into the position of the uterus. The uterus is seen to be placed in an antiverted and antiflexed position over the urinary bladder. This is the general position of the uterus. And if you try to drive in into this, this antiverted and antiplex position is in respect to specific organs around the uterus. We know that at the inferior region of the uterus, the structure that we have there is the vagina canal. This is where we have the vagina canal, this inferior region. So if you take a longitudinal part or plane along the vertical axis of the vagina canal, and this is what is highlighted here in blue, you see that the uterus is positioned antivertedly over the urinary bladder in respect to the vagina canal. So this is how the antiverted position of the uterus is placed around this region. And this angulature here created is about 90 degrees. So you see that at 90 degrees, taking a vertical or longitudinal axis along the vagina canal, the uterus is placed in an antiverted position over the urinary bladder, creating an angle of 90 degrees. And this is in respect to the vagina canal. Then if you take the position of the uterus in respect to the cervix, we know that the cervix is the inferior region of the uterus. 
we'll be describing the different subregions of the terrors as we go through with this lecture. But just for us to know at this point that the cervix is the inferior region of the terrors. And if you take an alignment along its vertical axis too, that is highlighted here in yellow, you see that the uterus is positioned in an anti-flexed position. And this takes an angle of about 170 degrees. And this is what is highlighted here in white. So if you take the vertical axis along the cervix, the position of the uterus will be in an anti-flexed position. And this is what is exacted here in the image. So it depends on the organ or structures that you are using to create this alignment. If it is the vaginal canal, it is going to be placed in an antiverted position over the urinary bladder. But if you want to take it in respect of the cervix, it's going to be placed in an antiflex position over the urinary bladder. So this is the general position of the uterus. And this does not mean that we do not have other position of the uterus, but this is what the majority of the human population will exhibit in respect of the position of the uterus. The uterus can be placed in a retroverted or retroflex position. And this means that the uterus will be directed more vertically and even directed also towards the spine. So when you see it taking a more vertical presentation or even directed towards the spine posteriorly, this is retroverted or retroflex position. But this is not the general configuration that we have in respect to the position of the uterus. What is presented here in this image, which is the antiverted and antiflex position, is what is seen as the general position of the uterus. So let's try and take the dimension of the uterus. The uterus is seen along its vertical axis to have a length of about 7.5 centimeters. While transversely, it takes about 5 centimeters. Then the thickness of the uterus is about 2.5 centimeters. So this is also the general dimension of the uterus. And it's good that we are able to highlight this in case we are hard during examination. So let's drive through to the functions of the uterus. This is where we have the uterus here carried at this point. So that it is located at this central portion. So for the first function is that it creates the accommodation site for the fertilized egg. We say that after this egg is released by the ovary, it is released and directed into the lumen of the uterine tubes. This is where we have the uterine tube here on one side, and this is the other one on the other side. So they run and are pushed towards the ampulla region. The ampulla region of the uterine tube is a specific region that is designed for fertilization. And after fertilization, the head will then need to be implanted. And this uterus is what creates the site for the implants. And this is where the final implantation will occur. The second function of the uterus is that it creates physical protection for the developing embryo. After implantation, the implant will be subjected to further development. And the uterus is seen to create the physical accommodation site also for the developing embryo. Apart from creating the site for implantation, it is also helping to create a physical support for this structure to further develop. Then it's also seen to provide nourishment. So it's seen to provide nutritional support. Within the wall of the uterus, we have uterine glands. These uterine glands secrete substances that help to nourish the developing embryo. It is also seen to create the means through which waste are removed from the developing process. We know that as development proceeds, the implant will develop into embryo. It is then transformed into the process. So at this level, the waste that is removed from the developing fetus is also collected through the uterus, and it does this through the placenta. Then it's also seen to exhibit contraction during vaginal birth. We know that vaginal birth requires that the fetus will be released through the vaginal canal before it is finally taken out of the body. And it is the contraction and relaxation process that the wall of the uterus exerts that helps to push this fetus out of the uterine cavity. So it's also contributing to the process of vaginal birth in this regard. Finally, uterus is also targeted during the process of menstruation. We know that after the release of a mature egg from the ovary, we say that this egg is released into the lumen of the uterine tube for fertilization to occur. So after fertilization within the wall of the uterine tube, the next process is for implantation to occur. What happens to the endometrium lining of the uterus is to undergo proliferation. 
This proliferation is the thickening of the endometrial wall, so as to create the space for the implant. But in the absence of fertilization, which means that the egg is not fertilized, then the endometrium lining that is already thickened to receive the implant will then need to be shed for. And this is what leads to menstruation. So you see that the uterus is also the organ of target during the process of menstruation. So it also contributes to this process. So let's drive further to see the connection that the uterus also creates with the surrounding structure. This is where we say we have the uterus here at this point. The first connection is the connection that it creates with the uterine tubes. Remember, we say that we have tubular extensions from the lateral wall of the uterus as uterine tube. We also say that the process of fertilization will occur in the uterine tube. After this process, the egg that is fertilized will then be implanted into the uterine wall. This is where we have the uterine tube, higher there in blue, and this is where we have the connection created between the uterus and also the uterine tube. And the junction where we have this connection is called the uterotubal junction, because after the fertilization of the egg in the ampulla region, the fertilized egg will need to be taken back into the uterus. So there is a connection between the lumen of the uterine tube and also the cavity of the uterus. So there's a connection created around this upper region. While in the lower region, we have the uterine cavity connected to the vaginal canal. At this region is where we have the vaginal canal harrowed in grain. So at this inferior region here, we have the cavity of the uterus also connected to the vaginal canal. We know that during vaginal beds, the fetus needs to be pushed through the cavity of the uterus down to the vaginal canal. And this is because there's actually a link between the cavity of the uterus and also the vaginal canal. So this is where we have the limit of the uterus here, highlighted in dotted green. And at this inferior region here of the uterus is where we have the cervix. So it is through the cervix that the uterine cavity connects with the vagina canal. And this is what is shown here in this image. So now let's go to the regions of the uterus. The uterus is seen to have different sub-regions. And this is what this slide will be unfolding. The first region is the pondus. And the pondus is created at the most superior part of the uterus. So if you try to take a plane along this axis, which is the axis that has the emergence of the two uterine tubes. Remember we say that the lateral wall border of the uterus, we have the emergence of the uterine tube on both sides. And it creates an alignment towards the point where we have the emergence of this uterine tube. At this superior region here is where we have the pondus. So the pondus is created above the plane that aligns with the entrance or the emergence of the uterine tube. And this is what is carried there at this point. These pondus can be used to gauge the stage of pregnancy. When pregnancy occurs, depending on its level, the pondus is seen to extend to the superior region. So that at full term of pregnancy, the pondus can be seen at the level of the ninth thoracic vertebra. So it tends to be pushed up so as the number of days of pregnancy increases. So this level of the pondus here at this head can be used to gauge the stage of pregnancy. If you go more inferiorly to the pondus, we have the body. And this is where we have the body here carried in green. As a matter of fact, this is the cavity or the lumen of the body of the uterus. This can also be referred to as a corpus. And this is the usual site of implantation. Implantation will occur at the upper part of the posterior region of the body of the uterus that is directed close here to the pondus. Then if you go at the inferior region of the body, there is a constriction that is created around this lower part. And this is what is highlighted here in dotted green. And this specific region here is referred to as the isthmus. So you have a very short constricted region around the inferior border of the body of the uterus. And this is what is referred to as the isthmus. The isthmus is a very short constricted region that is about one centimeter in length. So it's a very short portion or region of the uterus where this constriction occurs. This isthmus align with the point where we have internal holes or the internal orifice of the uterus. And this is what is highlighted here in yellow. So you see this constricted point forming an alignment with where you have a thickening around this region. And this is what is referred to as the internal holes or the orifice. Then if you go more inferiorly, you have the cervix. This is where we have the cervix here, arrowed in yellow. 
the service is bounded superiorly by the isthmus and inferiorly by the cranial or the superior region of the vagina canal. And this is what is seen here around this region. This region is seen as a narrow cylindrical portion that forms the inferior limit of the uterus. The cervix is a subperitoneal organ, which means that it is located below the peritoneal covering. Sub means below. If you go back to the peritoneal covering of the uterus, we say that even though the uterus is an intraperitoneal organ, in the anterior border, the peritoneal covering is limited to the isthmus. So it is limited to this border where we have the constriction here. And this is where it is leaving the cervix, which is the inferior region of the uterus to be subperitoneally placed. So you have this peritoneal covering in the anterior region limited to the isthmus here. And this is where it is then seen to form a fold or recess over the structure that is located anterior to it, which is the urinary bladder. And if you go more posteriorly, this kind of presentation is also exhibited around the posterior border of the uterus, where the peritoneal covering is also seen to form a recess around the posterior region, also over the structure that is located posterior to it, which is the rectum. So you see it in the anterior part is forming a recess or a pouch. Also in the posterior part, it is also seen to form a recess or a pouch. But we'll be dwelling more on this as we go through with this lecture. And this is where we have the limit of the cervix here, also highlighted in dotted yellow. You see that the limit here also tally with the superior edge or superior border of the vagina canal. So along the cavity of the cervix, we have the cervical canal, and this is what is harrowed here in yellow. So you have a canal also created along the lumen of the cervix, and this canal is also seen to be continuous superiorly with the cavity or the lumen of the body of the uterus. So there is a continuation created around this region. But just for us to know that there's constriction created around the isthmus, and also at the inferior region here, we also have another constriction here created due to thickening. And this is what is also highlighted here in yellow. So at this inferior region, we have the external oris or the external orifice. So you see that we have the internal oris and we also have the external oris. So this internal and the external oris are seen to mark the superior border and also the inferior border of the cervix. So it is around the cervix that you have these orifices created. These are just constricted points created around this region. So that structures are not just allowed to flow as they will. It is also important for us to add that part of the cervix is seen to extend into the vagina canal. If you look at the configuration of the cervix here, you see that part of it is seen to extend into the vagina canal. And this is why the cervix is then further subdivided into two regions based on this picture. So we have the endocervix. The endocervix is the bulk of the cervix and it is the proximal region that is located as part of the uterus. So you see it at the inferior region of the body of the uterus. Why if you go more inferiorly, we have the ectocervix. Ecto means more at the external region. So we have the endocervix and also the ectocervix. The ectocervix is a small region of the cervix that is seen to extend into the vagina canal. Because of the parts that the cervix run extending into the vaginal canal and specifically around the region where we have the ectocervix, it is seen to form an expansion around the upper region of the vaginal canal. And this is where we have the creation of phonics. This phonics is an expanded region of the vaginal canal that is created as a result of a sub-region of the cervix extending into the vaginal canal. And this is what is created here around this region. So if you look at the cervix from this region that is demarcated in green to this region that is demarcated here in yellow, you see that part of the cervix is seen as part of the inferior component of the uterus. Why if you go more inferiorly at this region, you see that part of the cervix is seen to extend into the vagina canal. So you see this phonix here, which is the expanded part of the superior region of the vagina canal that is created as a result of the service penetrating into the space of the vagina. And this is what is created here at this region. So this is important for us to highlight that the cervix is further subdivided into two sub-regions because of the part that it runs in extending into the vagina canal. So let's go to the ligament of the uterus. The ligament of the uterus has structures that are seen to provide structural support for the uterus. We know that the uterus is a soft tissue organ. It is a muscular organ. 
And of course, it needs to be supported. This is where these ligaments come in play, where they are helping to structurally hold the uterus in place. And the first ligament that we would be talking about is the broad ligament. The broad ligament is like a wrapper that is made up of subregions. And you see that this broad ligament is helping to structurally hold the uterus with the surrounding structure and also helping to hold it with the lateral pelvic wall. We're using this image to describe how we have the emergence of the broad ligament. Remember that the uterus is an intraperitoneal organ, which means that it has peritoneal covering around its surfaces. This is where we have the uterus here. And if you look at the alignment of the peritoneum here, you see that it is actually covered by peritoneum. The peritoneal covering at this lateral edge of the uterus, you see that they are seen to merge together. So they come together at this lateral region, and this is where we have the emergence of the broad ligament. So it is the lateral emergence of the peritoneal covering of the uterus. So upon this emergence that is referred to as the broad ligament, you then see this broad ligament laterally connected to the lateral pelvic wall at this further end. So you see it extending from the lateral border of the uterus and finally getting its insertion point on the lateral pelvic wall. And along the course that the broad ligament runs, you see that it is also helping to anchor the ovary and also the uterine tube. And this is where the subregion of the broad ligament is also taken as the mesentery of these two organs. So the broad ligament is structurally divided into the mesometrium. The mesometrium is the mesentery of the uterus. And if you look at at this point here, that is carried in dotted blue, is where we have the mesometrium. This is the largest subregion of the broad ligament. Then the second subregion of the broad ligament is the mesoverium, which is the mesentery of the ovary. If you look at this image that is carried in dotted black, this is the ovary. We also have the mesentery of the ovary, which is the mesoverium. And this is what is carried at this upper edge in black. So you see the mesoverium also as a subregion of the broad ligament of the uterus. If you go much superiorly, you have the mesosalpins. The mesosalpins is the mesentery of the uterine tube. This is where we have the uterine tube here, also carried in dotted yellow. And if you go more inferiorly here, you have the mesosalpins. The mesosalpins is the mesentery of the uterine tube. So you see that the broad ligament that is seen like a wide wrapper emerging from the lateral egg of the uterus and finally terminating or inserted on the lateral pelvic wall. It's also seen to be anchoring the ovary and also the uterine tube along with it. And at its specific region, you see it also creating the mesenteries of these two organs. So we have the mesoverium, the mesosalpins, and also the mesometrium which of course we then come together to then form the broad ligament. So you see that this broad ligament, apart from helping to connect the uterus with the ovary and also the uterine tube, it is also helping to hold the uterus to the lateral pelvic wall. So this is one of the ligaments that are seen to provide structural support for the uterus. We'll be looking at the other ligaments of the uterus that are also helping to create further structural support for this organ. And the first one we'll be looking at in the anterior connection, which is the ligament that is seen to connect the uterus to structures in the anterior region. And this is where it is helping to create the anterior connection for the uterus. We also have the lateral connection of the uterus. This is also where we have ligaments connecting the uterus laterally. And this is where it is helping to create lateral connection also for the uterus. Then finally, we have the posterior connection. This is where we have ligaments helping to hold the uterus towards the posterior pole. And this is where it is also helping to create posterior connection. So you see that we have different ligaments at different regions helping to hold the uterus in place. So let's look at the ligaments in the anterior part. We have the pubocervical ligament. The pubocervical ligament, just from here breaking down the name, as I've always said on this channel, this will be a ligament connecting the cervical region of the uterus to the pubic symphysis. And if you look at this lower image, this is where we have the uterus here, carried at this point. This is where we have the ovary, and this is where we have the uterine tube. Remember in our previous slide, we already described the broad ligament, which is like a wrapper, helping to anchor these three structures, and finally taping them to the lateral pelvic wall. So the pubo cervical ligament is seen at this inferior region. 
And this is where it is helping to hold the anterior lateral surface of the cervix to the pubic symphysis. This is what we have here highlighted in yellow. We have one on this side and we have the other one on the other side. You see that this cervical ligament is helping to create anterior support for the itcherous. So using this hopper image, we try to create an alignment around this region. This is where we have the itcherous here, here at this point. Anteriorly, we have the urinary bladder and posteriorly here we have the rectum. Remember we said that the itcherous is sandwiched between the urinary bladder anteriorly and posteriorly the rectum. Why more posteriorly behind the rectum, we have the spine. And the region of the spine that we have here is the sacrum. So you see this alignment created around this region. So in trying to establish the pubocervical ligament, and this is how it runs here uh, in this image. So you see it connecting the anterior lateral surface of the cervix, which is the inferior region of the itcherous. It is seen to be connecting this specific region to the pubic symphysis. So this is how it runs in this hopine. Then the second ligament that we have creating anterior support for the itcherous is the round ligament. The round ligament is seen to emerge from the itcheri on or the itcheri con. Around this region that is harrowed in red is where we have the itcheri on. The itcheri on is around the region where we have the emergence of the itcheri too. So you have round ligament emerging from this region and directed through the deep inguinal ring. Where it is seen to access the inguinal canal and finally seen to exit the inguinal canal through the superficial inguinal ring. And from this region, you see the fibers merge onto the labial majora. So you see it finally inserted on the labial majora and this is where it is creating anterior support for the uterus. This round ligament is an embryonic remnant that is referred to as the vernaculum. It is seen to assist in the descent of the ovary. We know that during developmental anatomy, the ovary is developed in the abdominal space. And this ovary, of course, will descend where it will finally be positioned within the pelvic cavity. Along this process of descending, we have the gubernaculum contributing to this process. And of course, the remnant of the gubernaculum is what transforms into the round ligament of the uterus. And this is where it is seen to be connecting the uterus to the labial major. So using this upper image, this is where we have the round ligament here, highlighted in dotted red. We also have the other one here on the other side. And this is where it is seen to connect the iteri on to the labial major, which is located, of course, in the anterior part. It's also important for us to add that the round ligament is important during pregnancy. This round ligament is seen to expand or stretch during pregnancy. And this is where it is helping to relieve the uterus and allowing it the space to expand upwards, also further into the abdominal space. We also have other ligaments creating the lateral connection of support for the uterus. And the first one here is the uterovarian ligament. Just from here breaking down the name, the uterovarian ligament is seen to connect the uterus with the ovary. If you look at this lower image here, this is where we have the uterovarian ligament carried in green. You see it connecting the lateral wall of the uterus to the uterine end of the ovary. And this is how it runs to and fro these two structures, helping to also create connection and support for them. If you use this hopper image here, this is where we have the ovary, one on this side and the other one on the other side. And we have the uterovarian ligament here, highlighted in dotted green, connecting the lateral wall of the uterus to the ovary on one side so connecting the lateral wall of the uterus also on the other side to the ovary. So this is how we have structural support also created by the uterovarian ligament. This nice ligament that we have creating lateral support is the cardinal ligament. The cardinal ligament can also be referred to as the Mackenroth ligament. can also be referred to as the transverse cervical ligament. Just from the name transverse, it means it has a transverse orientation. And this ligament also contributes to the lateral connection of the uterus. And you see it emerging from the lateral wall or border of the cervix. Some of the fibers also extend from the upper margin or the phonics of the vagina canal. And they are finally inserted onto the lateral pelvic wall. If you try to use this lower image here, this is where we have the emergence of the cardinal ligament here, highlighted in purple. You see it emerging from the lateral border of the cervix 
and also the lateral border of the vaginal fornix. And finally, they are seen to be inserted onto the lateral pelvic bone. But they specifically take their insertion point on the ischial spine. And this is what is exhibited here in this view. If you go to this upper image, you have the cardinal ligament highlighted in purple, connecting the lateral edge of the cervix and also the upper region of the vaginal canal, which is the vaginal fornix, to the lateral pelvic bone. And this lateral pelvic bone is specifically on the ischial spine. So you have one on this side and you have the other one on the other side. So these are the two ligaments creating lateral support for the uterus. Then let's go to the posterior support. We have ligaments also connecting the uterus posteriorly. And this ligament is the uterosacral ligament. Uterosacral ligament, just for me breaking down the name, we know that this ligament will connect the uterus to the base of the sacrum. So if you try to use this lower image, because this is the anterior view, so the uterosacral ligament will be seen at the posterior region. So it cannot be shown here in this lower image. But in this upper image, this is where we have the terosacral ligament connecting the posterior region of the cervix to the base of the sacrum. And this is what is seen here in this image. So you have this ligament creating posterior support for the uterus. So these are the ligaments creating support for the uterus. And we try to divide them into the anterior group, the lateral group, and also the posterior group. So let's look at the pouches created by the uterus. We know that the uterus is an intraperitoneal organ, but we say that in, in the anterior border, the peritoneum is not seen to completely cover the uterus and also posteriorly. But in the lateral head here, you have the two peritoneal covering merging to form the emergence of the broad ligament. If you look at this supply made, this is where we have the uterus carried in blue. If you look at the peritoneal covering of the uterus, you see that it is not covering the entire uterus. At this lateral region here, we have the peritoneal coverings merging to form the emergence of the broad ligament. So this is where we have the emergence of the broad ligament, of course, running laterally, where it will finally be inserted on the lateral pelvic wall. Also along the cord, you see it can cover the ovary and also the uterine tube. And this is where it is also forming part of their mesenteries. We try to highlight this in our previous slide. So if you look at the anterior border here, you see that the peritoneal covering is not extending towards the entire anterior surface. We say that this peritoneal covering is limited to the Xmos. And at this region, you see the termination of the peritoneal covering, which means that the cervix is not seen to be covered with peritoneum. This now plays the cervix as a subperitoneal organ, which means organ that is located below the peritoneum. So this deficit around this region, carried in red, will be creating a form of recess around this anterior region. So this is what this slide will be unfolding. So the first recess that is created in the anterior region is the uterocervical pouch. You have a pouch created in the anterior region of the uterus. Remember going back to where we started this lecture, we said that the uterus is located between the urinary bladder anteriorly and the rectum posteriorly, which means that the urinary bladder is the organ or structure that is located anterior to the uterus. So if a recess or a pouch will be formed due to the deficit created in this anterior part and will be formed over the organ that is located anterior to it, it will definitely be the urinary bladder. So let's use this lower image here. This is where we have the urinary bladder here, harrowed in black, that is located anterior to the uterus. And if you look at this point, also harrowed in black, you see that the peritoneal covering running towards the anterior surface of the body, as soon as it gets to the isthmus, which is the constricted part of the body of the uterus, you see that there is a recess or a pouch that is formed over the base of the urinary bladder. And this is what is referred to as the uterovesical pouch. Vesical is the urinary bladder and utero is the uterus. So you have the uterovesical pouch created due to the deficit of peritoneal covering in the anterior wall or border of the uterus. So this is what is created in the anterior part. For the posterior region, the difference between the anterior part and the posterior part is that the peritoneal covering descends more inferiorly. So if you go to the posterior region, we have the rectum. This is the rectum here. So we have the peritoneal covering also, although going more inferiorly 
than what is seen in the anterior part, it is also seen to form a pouch over the structure that is located posterior to it. And this is where we have the creation of the recto ichera pouch. Recto is the recto, ichera is the ichera. So you have a pouch or a recess created between the posterior border or wall of the uterus and also the anterior border or wall of the rectum. And this is where we have the recto uterine pouch. This recto uterine pouch can also be referred to as the recto vaginal pouch. Remember, we said that the peritoneal covering around this posterior region descends more inferiorly, even to the point where we have the vaginal phonic. And this is where it can also be referred to as the recto vaginal pouch. This recto vaginal pouch can also be referred to as the pouch of Douglas. So this is the kind of presentation that you have in the anterior and the posterior borders of the uterus. But remember that on the lateral edge, we have the two peritoneal covering merging, where it will then lead to the emergence of the broad ligament of the uterus. So this is the interesting part of the peritoneal covering of the uterus. And you see that in the lateral part, it forms a broad ligament that is helping to anchor the uterus to the lateral pelvic pole and also supporting the other two structures, which are the ovaries and the uterine tubes that are located around it. Why the anterior and the posterior but that it is seen to form pouches or recesses? This is what we have highlighted in this slide. So let's now drive through to the relation. This should come easy. If you've been going through this lecture from the beginning, you should be able to list the organs that are located at specific regions of the uterus. So for anterior relations, we have the urinary bladder, we have the uterovesical pouch. Using this upper image, this is where we have the urinary bladder here, and this is where we have the uterovesical pouch. Remember this structure here that is antiverted and antiflexed over the urinary bladder is the uterus. So anteriorly, you have the urinary bladder and you have the uterovesical pouch. Posteriorly, the structure that you have will then be the rectum. This is where we have the rectum, and you also have the rectoiterine pouch. This is what is also carried in red. The rectoiterine pouch within this space, you have the zygmoid colon. After the zygmoid colon, the next structure that you would have is the rectum. So for you to have the rectum here, yeah, this part of the zygmoid colon will be seen within the rectoiterine pouch. So if you go more in the lateral region, the structure that you would see is the broad ligament of the uterus. And using this lower image, this is where we have the broad ligament of the uterus. We already described how we have the emergence of the broad ligament of the uterus. Then within the broad ligament, you have the uterine vessels and also nerves. And this is where they are also helping to create support for these vessels. Then at this upper head here, we have the uterine tube. We have one on this side, have the other one also on the other side. Then you have the ovaries. You have one here and you have the other one also on the other side. So Superiorly, the structure that is seen on top of the uterus is the intestine. Why inferiorly we have the vaginal canal? Using this image up here, this is where we have the uterus. And inferior to it, at this region that is harrowed in grain, is where we have the vaginal canal. More inferiorly to the vaginal canal, we have the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. And we know that more inferiorly to the pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm, we have the urogenital diaphragm. The urogenital diaphragm is located in the anteriorly placed urogenital triangle, just a corresponding name triangle, where we have the anal triangle located behind. So we have inferior to the uterus, we have the vaginal canal. Inferior to the vaginal canal, we have the pelvic floor or the pelvic diaphragm. While inferior to the pelvic floor, the pelvic diaphragm, we then have the urogenital diaphragm. And we also have the perineal body also seen around this structure. So now let's go to the blood supply. The major blood supply of the uterus is from the uterine artery, just a corresponding name artery. And this artery is seen as an emergence from the internal iliac artery. We also have a supporting supply from the ovarian artery. We know that the ovarian artery is an emergence from the abdominal aorta. Then we have the venous drainage into the uterine venous plexus. The innervation, sympathetic innervation, is through the inferior to gastric now, which exerts contraction effects. While the parasympathetic supply is via the pelvic splanchnic now, which ranges from the second third to the fourth sacrospinal nerve. And this exhibits inhibition and also vasodilation. For the lymphatic drainage is through the iliac lymph nodes, while the specific region of the uterus, which is the fundus, is drained into the paraiotic lymph nodes. Clinical anatomy, let's look at uterine fibroids. 
The fibroid is a benign tumor that develops in the wall of the uterus, specifically in the myometrium. So the myometrium is the muscular layer of the uterus. So where you see tumor beginning to grow around the space, but these tumor are benign in nature, which means that they do not have the capacity to spread to other regions. They will just begin to grow within that space. Symptoms that may arise from this include heavy and painful menstruation, painful sexual intercourse, and also frequent urination. Treatment options include medication to relieve the pains and also surgery. Specific type of surgery that is done in respect to uterine fibroids is myomectomy, which is the removal of this tissue. Ultrasound, a non-invasive procedure to target the fibroid tissue to destroy them. Then we can have uterine and also cervical cancer, where you have tumor growths that are malignant, which means that they have the capacity to spread to the surrounding structure. If they occur within the uterus, they will be referred to as uterine cancer. And if they occur within the cervix, which is the distal or the inferior region of the uterus, they will be referred to as cervical cancer. And when this occur, hysterectomy, which is the total removal of the uterus, is usually done so as to prevent the movement of this cancerous cell to the surrounding structure. Then let's look at endometriosis. Endometriosis is when you have the endometrial tissue developing or growing outside the womb. We know that the endometrial tissue are supposed to be contained within the cavity of the uterus, and this is where it is needed to support implantation process. But when we have tissues moving out of space due to retrograde menstruation, we know that the uterus at this point is connected to the uterine tube. So there is a possibility of the endometrial tissue that is supposed to be contained within the uterus traveling down through the lumen of the uterine tube. And we say that at this terminal portion, we have a connection of the uterine tube with the peritoneal cavity. So there's possibility that this endometrial tissue will be seen within the peritoneal cavity. And when they are seen to grow outside the uterus, it is referred to as endometriosis. And this comes with pelvic pain, painful period, and also discomfort. It can also cause a form of infertility. Major treatment options include medication and also surgery to remove this endometrial tissue from where they are seen outside the uterus. Then we can have prolapse of the uterus, which is the displacement of the uterus. Remember going through this lecture, we described a number of ligaments creating structural support for the uterus in the anterior part, the lateral part, and also the posterior part. So when there's loss of this support, the uterus will be displaced and it will be moved out of place. There is also tendency that the uterus will sag and also fall into the vaginal canal. Thanks for watching this video. Let's continue to stay glitched to the channel.